Oh, Bernardium, I sing to you across the galaxy, of which I'll never reach again. Oh, my alien love, I cannot breathe through the abysmal space between your tentacles and me. go impression extension red eye city on trent radio hmm where am i gonna start so that song there was or is that's my daughter from 2012 so that was eight years ago and that was a song that she wrote about an astronaut and an alien being in love and how they couldn't be um, or how they were trying to be connected and to live a life together. So 
you know, you can find that on um, YouTube at Nerd City 411. That is her older YouTube channel. She does a lot of covers, but that there, um, she wrote that herself and performed that in uh, in my basement. So the reason why I'm playing that and the reason why I'm talking about that is something that I've started um, recently, and I started to talk about it before, and what it is, is I've started to think about memories and events and pinpointing a specific event and then trying to go and recreate that event in my brain and then from that event try to learn or try to feel the surrounding circumstances as wide reaching as possible but trying to put myself into an emotional state of how I was at those times. So what I mean by that is that I will take an image or a picture or a memory that I have. I will concentrate on that. I don't want to say so much as meditating on it, but more so thinking about it and again, putting myself in that spot at that time to first of all, remember that time because then it will rebuild my memories, but also to feel the emotion and the feelings that I had at that time. Now, that's not easy, right? It's not something that I would say is something that uh, can be done just for fun or uh, on whenever. But maybe it can. I I think everybody has their own version of how to navigate their memories. But for me, especially being here in Austria and, you know, once in a while being homesick and things like that, um, I've found that it is rewarding to look back on those memories. and But not just to say, hey, those were great memories but to really dissect the emotion and the feeling that I had and how that affected my life around that situation. So I've done this in good and in bad ways. Well, I don't want to say bad because nothing's bad, Um, but in a sense that there were negative things or things that I may perceive as a negative that shifted my life in a certain direction, and I'm trying to figure out what some of those things are. So I've been seeing, or I do see a therapist for a very long time. I love it. Um, I would suggest it if it is possible to do it. Uh, Some people might think that, you know, in order to go see a therapist, there has to be something wrong. No, that's not the case. Um, To go see a therapist sometimes just gives you an outlook or a different perspective that you can go then look within in order to discover more about yourself and just to overall to grow, right? I've always preached... um, awareness and how do you become more aware is really the question right I could sit here by myself all day and think all right I'm going to become more aware and then I look around and I read or I go and I work off of my past experiences thinking that those are the things that are going to be making me more aware well that would seem to be wrong I would think because if I'm going to try to become more aware of who I am and certain things that have affected my life, I can't look within myself to decide and to create more awareness because I would all be already be aware of all of that, if that makes sense. So I would need to then, therefore, look at other sources of influence in order for me to become more aware of the overall situation. And that's what I like to use a therapist for, right? I can go in and see him or her different times. I've had different genders doing, uh, having therapy right now. I've got a guy from Toronto and I'm able to talk about my ideas or thoughts or things that are on my mind. And he's able to pull and create more conversation and more insight to what I'm thinking. And then in turn, creating more awareness of other possibilities or things that may come from it. So what I've started to do is, again, like I said, I'm taking these moments in my life and I'm going to go over an example of one that I just talked to my therapist about the other day and I just really rediscovered this this, um, experience that I had when I was younger and how it would affect me and how maybe it has affected me and this comes down to relationships and things like that but probably even more I've just only started digging into it so at first I thought okay how much harm can this happen and I think okay you know what really no harm because if you're not risking harm in order to grow well then you're really not taking advantage of all of the opportunities that we would think can make us grow in different directions if we stick to our comfort zone and don't go outside or or allow ourselves to be in harm's way, well then again, we're protecting what we've already established of who we are and what we think and not allowing different types of things to come in. 
And so this is so again, so this is kind of what I've been doing. So that song right there, Bernardium, is a song that my daughter wrote and sang. And I'm able to now look at that video and then reflect back on that time from 2012. I can see what the basement looks like. Sorry, I can see what the basement looks like. I can see all around. And I can put my place, I can put myself in that moment. And where I can see it really vividly is in that actual moment. And as the memory expands wider to the surrounding areas, which is what I would just call collateral memory, right? The wide, it's just like when you throw a stone into water, you've got that initial blob or whatever that thing is. And then you've got the ripple effect. And as that ripple effect goes wider, you lose those memories, right? It gets weaker. So I'm trying to essentially is take that memory and then see what that ripple effect and try to discover and dig deeper into that because it's got to be there, right? We have memories that we can recall from certain times. Well, can we just recall the memory as what it is in a visual or can we recall that memory as an emotion and really close your eyes and see how that affected you or how you felt within that memory and I think there's a lot of memories that we look at and we don't associate emotions to those memories we just more uh, associate an experience or a visual of that memory and then that's all that's where we go from there now that could be totally off again I'm not an expert at anything other than the fact that I have a life and I've lived and I have friends and I talk to them and that's all where my expertise comes from sure i've got some schooling and but all that but it's really these are just my thoughts that i like to talk about and strategies that i think uh, are um, valuable in order to discover more of who you are so last week i talked about that and i talked about the collateral effect of actually listening and communication right you have some sort of communication you learn from that that specific event then you kind of evaluate all of the things that have come around from that conversation or the communication and then you build a whole repertoire of communication styles that are in order to pull more information from that initial uh, part of communication and you can grow from there so but for now what I'm trying to do and I'm not sure maybe this is what meditation is all about I don't know because I'm not a very good meditator yet if anybody has any suggestions please let me know but I I myself I'm struggling with that And maybe, again, this is where I need to pay a little bit more attention. But what I'm trying to say is that there's events in your life that have affected the way that you are, good and bad. And if we are to really, truly want to grow as an individual, I would think that you need to address and you need to confront some of these staple memories in your data bank of your brain and then go from there and to discover more about yourself if you have time now this is where a huge problem arises and that is time and effort right who really wants to go dig deep into a maybe negative thought or a memory in order to discover more about it and how that has affected your life Mm, i don't know like Does everybody want to do that? I I don't know. Maybe. Um, Does anybody have time to do that? I don't I don't think so. You know, it takes a strong person, I would think, to be able to go deep down inside, pull something that has affected their life, analyze it subjectively and learn from it. Now, I would think that everybody would want to do that, but not everybody thinks that the way thinks the way I do or thinks in this type of scope. Now, what is important to me is important to me. What is important to somebody else is important to them, right? So there is no judgment on how deep or how empathetic that someone might want to be, even within themselves, right? There's a good question. I, You know what? Here's something that just popped into my brain. I talk about empathy and I talk about being empathetic. And there is no way that, and we talked about this in class too, but there is no way literally that I could be empathetic truly in a sense of gender or or ethnicity, right? I am a white man and that's kind of where I come from. I couldn't assimilate fully uh, from a woman or any other gender or in any other ethnicity. And to think that you can would be a little bit um, naive, but what I can do is I can try to learn and listen and understand 
and be that ally to those genders and all these ethnicities and maybe try to get a sense of an empathetic view from education and from experiences from people in order for me to kind of come up with this empathetic view and a perspective that I would have to put myself into when I'm talking or communicating with somebody else, right? So for an example, I may go on a date and that date might say and talk about an experience that uh, that person had and I would, or how they feel about the way that they've been created and the way that their outlook is. And I would have to kind of rewind that in my brain. And this is all again, split second and think about, okay, here we go. This is this person's experiences. These are kind of, I understand a little bit from my education and from the way that I've lived. And then I try to put myself in their shoes to understand where they're coming from in order for me to get a better comprehension of the entirety of that situation and what we're talking about, as opposed to just listening to the words that they're saying. And then all of a sudden just construing a message and thinking about it upon my own subconscious and the own experience that I've had and connecting them that way. You know, I try to put myself into that empathetic view. Now, empathy, I talk about sometimes, and a lot of people think empathy is bad, right? You need to be empathetic when someone's sad. You need to be empathetic when someone's hurt. You need to be empathetic when someone's getting hurt. Well, sure, that's one thing, but also being empathetic to the way that people live their lives is another thing all in it together right you may find or you may see somebody or you might start to date somebody that is really into um, health and fitness right And, and you may not be so much and you may not be so much because you have good genetics and a good metabolism and then your body runs good and it looks good so you may think okay you know what you are putting in way too much effort you could probably spend more effort somewhere else But we don't know truly what that person has gone through in order to get to that space where they think exercise and all of those things are important. So discovering and becoming more attuned to the person you're communicating with, I would think, would be most important before you get into some of these deep conversations with people. But the deep conversations are actually what essentially create this empathetic view of who you're talking to or about. Then it creates kind of, you know, you become more attuned to it. So I think for one, empathy and trying to look at everything through that empathetic lens, whether good or bad, is one of the most important things that you need to do. And I don't think you can do this all the time consciously. I think this is something that needs to be built up within and from inside you in order for it to become practice. And I talk about manifestation and I talk about things like that on how I believe manifestation can happen because I think manifestation is something that you can flex and you can grow and you can force feed in a sense that if you believe in something truly and if you action those things like a habit, it becomes part of you and then by just by nature it would then reflect in the world and around you and then you would all of a sudden be able to manifest things in your life a little bit easier. I think that's the same thing with empathy and actually reading people and being able to communicate properly with people is something that you actually need to focus on and practice in order for your subconscious to take over and to gather all of this empathetic information from everywhere subjectively and be able to put that together quickly in your sub in your just in you and then be able to reflect that back to the person so the reason why I'm kind of I kind of got off track there a little bit but how I'm trying to tie this together is that I think that being empathetic to others is one thing but you can also be empathetic to yourself right so this kind of gets me a little bit emotional in the sense that when you look back at yourself, say as a child, you really need to try to put yourself into that position of your childhood and what was go- all going around. Uh, what was all going on around you at that time, right? You were not the same person at 35, 40, 25, whatever, than you were at 10 years old, right? Your life and what your life seemed to be like and how the things affected your life when you were 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever is not the same as the the way you are now. So when I take these moments in my life, which is what I'm really spinning everything back to, is when you take these moments that that you think may have affected your life, maybe not, by discovery you might realize that no, that was nothing, that was just a memory, we move on from there. But you're going to hit memories that you are going to be able to connect to 
other things in the way that you have become the person that you are. And when doing that and reflecting back on that, you really, really, really need to be able to put yourself in your own shoes at that time of that situation. Now, how do we do that? I don't know, right? I don't have that answer. I'm practicing, I'm trying to, and I'm trying to learn from it. And this is where the therapist is helping me as well, right? He's giving me trigger questions in order for me to dig deeper. And hopefully I can. So I want to talk about a memory that I've had. I've gone through a whole bunch, some good, some bad, but some that are a little bit confusing that have made me think, whoa, here may be something that has affected my life in a way I think I should look a little bit deeper into this and then I have. So I'm going to talk about a situation that I went through. Um, Let me check the time. 21 minutes. We're good. Um, I want to talk about a situation. Well, you know what? Hold on. I got to rewind a little bit. Last week. So, okay. I'm going to come back. You know know what? Forget it. I'm going to keep going. (laughs) As usual, a little bit scattered and not very comfortable right now. So anyway, what I'm trying to say here is that I've started to go back into some memories to see how those memories have affected my life in what way. And I'm open to it. I'm like, bring it on, whatever, right? I have, I have no time to dance around things when... Uh, when I, when I don't feel like it, right? Why not go all in on something like this if there's an ability and maybe some value to it? And maybe there's not. Maybe I'm going to be worse off from doing it, but I don't think I'm going to be. So anyway, let me get to this one example because this is one of those things that when I told my therapist, I think that was yesterday, he was like, I knew that that was something important because of A, his reaction, and then the way that we tried to dissect it and tried to work from it. Unfortunately, I brought it up at the end of our appointment and not at the beginning, but there was other things I have to deal with too. <sighs> Sorry, I had to have a drink. Now I'm back. So this situation happened to me when I was in grade four or five. So I think grade four or five, you're what? Eight or nine years old, 10 years old? And this situation, I'll try to articulate this or describe it as accurately as I can, and then I'll go from there and talk about the emotion or maybe the collateral consequence from this collateral consequence. That's a good word. Um, Because consequences aren't always bad. It's a consequence bad. I don't know. Like if you win the million dollars and the consequences from that is that you're able to not have to work, is that a good thing? Yeah, I would think that. So consequences can be bad or good. So we just decided that right now. <laughs> anyway, let me get back to this situation that I'm starting to dissect because I believe that this one moment in my life is one of those moments that has created who I am, especially in my head and some of the insecurities that I've had all the way up until this point. Now, we could sit here and talk about insecurities and if that's weak or not and how you know, men have to be strong or having an insecurity is a sign of weakness and that's horseshit. But I understand that that is out there in society in some spaces for whatever reason or not. Um, But I don't subscribe to it. Um, So here's the situation. When I was in grade four or five, I lived on the street with lots of kids, um, and uh, there was a park beside my house, like a forest, not huge, but big enough. And I had this girlfriend off and on kind of thing. Um, you know, we were just on the street, whatever. We just liked each other. We actually got caught, I think we were in grade four, naked on, <laughs> we were just lying naked on each other um, on like, her brother's like workout bench in a garage and we got caught for that i also got caught for the same person in grade six where um me and my other buddy were looking from his house to um into her house as they changed with binoculars and then her parents caught us and then my parents gave me shit and all that stuff too so this is like a type of situation where a lot of kids were on the street growing up together we're all kind of connected we used to play outside tag and hide and seek and all that stuff so anyway me and this one girl kind of were like ooh, your boyfriend and girlfriend kind of thing 
And uh, so that so that was that. So one day we were allowed to go to the movies and we were going to be dropped off and go to the movies by ourselves. Right. So this was a big, big deal when you're like eight or nine years old. Now, maybe not as big as it is these days, but back then, you know, that was a big event um, for the movies. So when we were before we went to the movies, I remember being in this park and hanging out with a bunch of kids and we were talking about, yeah, we're going to the movies. And one of the kids said, ooh, is so-and-so going to put her head on your shoulders and, like, be all romantic or whatever? And we all laughed about it and whatever. And it was kind of nothing, but it was, like, teasing. Ooh, she's going to do that. Ooh, you're going to be at the movies. All that kind of stuff. And, right, so that was in my brain. I'm thinking, okay, you know, you're a little kid. You're thinking whatever. So then we went to the movies. And at the movies, when we were sitting there... I had put my head on her shoulders as a joke, right? As a kind of fun, playful, oh, maybe I'll be the one to do this or whatever. And I don't remember the exact situation on that, but I do remember being there and doing that as a joke. And it literally lasted about five, ten seconds, maybe. Nothing, right? Total joke. So after the movie, whatever, we had the movie and it was fine and all that stuff. And then after the movie, I don't know if it was the next day or how close to it it was, is that we were back in that park because that's where everybody hung out. And um, people were asking about the movies. And she said to everybody that I put my head on her shoulders. And this to me at the time was unfair, right? This was a joke at the time. This was fun. This was playful. This was just between the two of us. It really wasn't anything big. It was literally a joke. But the way that it came out, it wasn't a joke, right? It was like, no, David was the one who put his head on my shoulders. And then as kids are kids and whatever, for whatever reason, they took that and they used that against me by making fun of me, by... um, teasing me and things like that now for me back then I have OCD and I had looking back at it now I had OCD affected me all the time and I became obsessed with that and what happened was I I was trying to plead my case no it was just a joke no it was just a joke like obviously like whatever yet the damage was already done and the more that I acknowledged it the more the teasing and the piling on became right it just became more and more without the validation of saying no it was just a joke because again we're just eight ten year old kids we're not really even thinking that far ahead but for me that moment was a moment when I actually lost trust in women and not just only that I started to question myself a little bit and my friendships that surround all of that because these were my friends now turning on me over something that was not actual factual And this is the type of thing that I'm starting to try to think about and work with. And I don't have a lot of answers from this situation because it's I'm really just working on this yesterday. Like it started. I started thinking about this last week and then I talked to him about this yesterday. But to me, this was a huge moment in my life. And when I told my therapist this story, he was like really intrigued and really started to try to pick up on the surrounding things and how that may have affected the way that I live. And I think there's a lot to it. You know, I think that there are moments in your childhood or growing up or even in your adulthood that shift and shape the way and who you are, whether by exposing maybe who you are or by it becoming more, if that makes sense, right? So there may be certain traits that I have that may be more of a certain direction in masculine or feminine that now become even more important or more exposed because of a situation. And this to me, this situation, when I think about it, and I've thought about it off and on um, for quite some time, is... Um, but not into this kind of detail and trying to kind of take some bigger perspective is that how do I look at myself, especially back in those moments, right? So now I need to take that moment and why was that bothering me, right? Why did that have such an effect on me? And this is where I start thinking about empathy and being empathetic to who I was as that kid. And, you know, I have an older brother and I have a younger sister And was there certain things in the household that made me think or create this um, 
reality of who I am that kind of allowed people to effectively use what they're saying and their thoughts to I don't want to say hurt me because that's one thing and and again I get it because we're kids but was I expressing other traits or other things of who I am that would have allowed that to become that or was that one of those moments that actually shifted and shaped me and I think it is I think you know this is right now and maybe I'll think about it different in a couple of weeks is that how is it that one event literally that happened like that could have an impact over your entire life and if you're not willing to go back maybe and you know recreate those moments or even just rethink those moments in your life how can you then really effectively grow from who you are at this moment when those foundations that have been built and have have been inside you for so long aren't getting acknowledged and like I said this isn't easy you know it's not one of these things that I think you could just do and be like okay now I'm good with that there go there's all my answers like this is a rabbit hole that I think I'm going to be going down and I have no idea where this is going to take me and I'm not afraid of that that's that's probably a good thing is that I'm willing to accept or just acknowledge that there is an opportunity here to discover more about myself and I'm throwing myself out there but I also understand that you know I may be opening myself up to some things that are going to hurt and some things that are going to make me reflect on maybe more parts of my life and how that they have turned out because of that one event now I'm not someone who regrets a lot Sure, I've made mistakes, 1,000%. And would I do certain things over again? Yeah, of course I would, right? That's a no-brainer to me. Now, would I, in effect, do those things and possibly have a different outlook on my whole life? Well, that's a different question, right? If we're talking one-offs and you would change something and it wouldn't if everything else would be the same, well, then sure. If there are things that I would change going back in time, that would just change where I am sitting right now, I don't know if I would do that. I don't think I would do that. I don't, right? So maybe, but I don't think so. So I'm okay with that. I'm okay with looking back in my past and not having so much of a regret, but just kind of looking at it in more of a objective point of view and thinking, hmm, this may have been something that has affected my life. Okay, so now I can accept that and then I can move forward from that. And I don't know if it's too late for me or if this is wasted opportunity. Maybe I should be focusing on some other things with my brain instead of you know looking back at what has made me me. But again, that's who I am, so that's what I'm gonna do. <sighs> if you kinda know what I mean. So it is an interesting topic, I think, in, in that, do we empathize with our younger selves enough and properly, right? Not in the scope that I see the world today, but in the vision that I would have seen the world back then. And so many things affect the way that you look at the world all the time. Because every experience you have now recre- sorry, starts to create something different in you and a way to look at things. I was in India for a month for yoga and they talked about philosophy and they talked about all of this um, prana and all of these things in this culture. And it makes me think, it actually, it actually reaffirmed some of the things that I have thought about. But it also made me think of other things Um and giving me a new and a different perspective on a, virtually everything, really. Um, I talked to my therapist about this the other day as well, is perspective. And this is one of those things that I find is tricky in when, and I believe I've talked about this before, is when I feel that there is um, uh, something wrong or I'm not okay or I'm in a downer Debbie Downer or whatever that I will look at the greater grandeur of perspective and then that gets me out of certain things now there are so there is so 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 much worse going on in everybody's life if you're listening to this then 
the vast, vast majority of the world is in a worse place than you. So what does that mean, right? Is it okay to feel down and depressed or beaten up if we still have all of these luxuries in the first world nation type of thing? And for me, that helps me get out of it, but it doesn't really truly get me out of it because we are kind of all in our own reality in a sense, right? What's happening in Africa or India right now with Corona is horrible. That said, it doesn't affect the realities very much of Canadians, Austrians, or Americans. So is that reality really part of our reality? And can we just forget about our own reality and our own emotions because there are worse off people? Now, I would have to say no, right? Because if we all are subject to um, mental illness, wherever we are, in hurt and pain and hard times and all of those things, no matter what reality we're in, and that is what affects us, not so much that, yes, we have good things to think about because we still feel pain. And pain is pain, right? You grow up rich, right? So you're rich, you're filthy rich, let's just say, and you are really an emotional rich person and you fall in love with somebody as hard as you can and this person is amazing and is great and then that other person does something that hurts you and you lose that relationship you're going to feel as much pain and as much hurt and grief as would someone who does not have a lot of money maybe living in a different country that goes through that same emotional situation where they find somebody and they get in a relationship and then that relationship goes to shit and they get hurt. So when I use though that example and I think of equal equal, well, really, pain is equal no matter where it's from. All things being the same about something like a relationship, right? That money doesn't make a difference between status doesn't make a difference when your heart's broken. I guess that's the e that may be one of the easiest things to think about when you're trying to make things equal amongst all of humanity is heartbreak is heartbreak. Now, can you get over heartbreak easier or different when you are in a different status? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know that answer. Maybe you could because you now you have the resources to a seek help that may have to cost money or to be able to not worry about surviving when it comes to the essentials of living. So maybe that might make it easier for somebody of a higher status to be able to overcome heartbreak easier or quicker. But I don't know that for sure. That would just be me thinking logically and thinking kind of not no brainerish, but kind of no brainerish where I would say that that could be a reason why it would be easier for them to come out of heartbreak, but heartbreak's heartbreak when it comes down to it. So we're at 39 minutes. I want to play a clip that I had last week where I did a short little, short little thing on my face and how I thought about it. I want to play that right now. So that we're going to cut to what I taped last week. And then I want to sum things up on how I've been going forward from last week and go from there. So Hopefully, you know, this kind of made a little bit of sense. Time went by quick this time um, and maybe re-listen. If you want to re-listen to this again, it is on my podcast. Two ways to do it. Easiest way is to Google Red Eye City, R-E-D-E-Y-E-C-I-T-Y. And then it just pops up and you can look for this episode, which is today or uh, or tomorrow, whatever. Um or it's on Spotify and on iTunes and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm going to cut to what I taped last week, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about it. Okay, here we go. I am in one of these moods for a quick thought that I was just thinking. And I even have music in the background. And for whoever listens, the eight people, then this is for you. And... Shout out, here's a quick shout out that is deserving. Someone in Spain is downloading my show every week. So either they got it hooked up by mistake or they don't. Either way, thank you and a shout out to Spain. <laughs> anyway, here's what I wanted to talk about today. And it's 
what I want to talk about is when you see a picture of yourself and it creeps you out. And what I mean by that is that when I see a picture of me, I've, I don't know, I, I want to bust out laughing because I look so weird. It looks like, I feel like I'm looking at a clown. Like, legitimately, I look at my face and it just, it makes no sense. And I don't know if that's just me or do other people feel that way when they look at themselves as well? Because I've never been able to do it once in a while. Very rarely, I will see a picture of me and I'll like it. And I'll be like, oh, okay, I like that. I'm like, okay, I look good or whatever. But that's so far and few between. Like, we're talking literally, I don't know, one in a thousand, it feels like. So, the other day, I went to get some pictures taken at a photo lady and she was great she does yoga same studio yoga and photo perfect way to use the space daytime photo nighttime yoga um anyway she took a bunch of pictures she took 80 and i as i scrolled through them i couldn't stop laughing and i would see certain pictures and i would bust out laughing out loud um without being able to stop sometimes and I don't know if I should be doing that. Like, am I laughing at myself? So then essentially creating an image of who I am by when I look at these pictures and then being that image out into the real world, which in turn is not the image that I want to represent or be. So if I think I look like a clown every time I see myself when I look at a picture, Am I internalizing that and it becoming my subconscious and then in turn, like I just said, creating that image of me through me and that's how the world will then see me because that's the way I see myself? That is exactly what's going on. So knowing that when you see a picture of yourself and if you don't like it or if you did never like a picture of yourself how do you navigate that do you take those pictures that you find that you really do like and do you drill those into your head right so if i've got six pictures maybe i don't think i even have 10 pictures of myself that i like enough that i would show to somebody and do I now take those 10 pictures and run them in my head every time I wake up, every time I look on my phone? Do I even make it my screensaver? Right. Right. You look at your screensaver all the time, all the time on your phone and your home screen. How important is that message that you're telling yourself, I'm going to change my screens today, literally. Um, but what is that message that you're telling yourself when you open your phone right from the minute you look at a screensaver? So for me right now, I click my phone, bam, oh, I've got, I've got a bunch of shark, like cartoon shark heads that are all looking weird and artsy and they look like weird shaped penises. Literally, I've got shark penis screensaver. If I could, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to show this on my Instagram because uh, that's well, weird. Why am I looking at that? So what is this creating in my life? Am I a penis shark? <laughs> I think I am. Maybe I am. <laughs> This screensaver's got to go immediately. So that's a to-do list. Uh, okay, so I'm going to hit my, I'm going to go onto my phone now. So now, okay, this isn't bad, but it's a little too slow. So on my home screen, I have a picture of my coffee table, a little zoom in. And on my coffee table, there's a glass shelf. And underneath the shelf, I have things that, like lighters or pens or gum or things that I've found on the ground in different cities around Europe that are shiny. And uh, Quantum and some other friends, they'll 
can attest to this. She calls me a crow because I literally find shiny things and then I grab them and then I put them under this table. So one of the things I have under this table, so this is the home screen on my phone now. And I got this at yoga in India. A couple of the um, participants there did like a little baking with some motivational speaking on it. And then you would pick one. So here's the one I got. And this is what is on my home screen all the time. But it's a little too small to actually like hit my subconscious quick. So it says, be brave enough to live the life of your dreams according to your vision, your purpose, instead of your expectations and opinions in others of others. Well, how accurate is that right now when I'm sitting here talking about my pictures of my face and the image that I think that people are have of me? And that doesn't stay like with just the face. That goes, now I'm getting emotional. Hmm. That goes... That goes deep, but I'm struggling right now. Okay, I've got it back. So that goes deep when you think about the way you think people think you are. And that impression that you have that then essentially creates your the way you live and the way you act, right? You wake up in the morning and you're trying to make yourself look a certain way, but that's not you, that's tough. But what about when you don't even know who you are, yet everybody has an impression of you? And how can they, if they don't know all of you, Right? How can anybody really know who that person is without a lot of work and a lot of, um, that takes time. That's not something that can happen quickly. You know, there's, there's ways of connecting faster. Sure, there's techniques to that 100% all the time. I do them all the time. Um, that's why I listen. It's just listening and actually listening. So... If that's true, I don't know. So and I did not think I would get here that quickly. All I did was wanting to come on here and talk about my pictures and how I think I look goofy. But now realizing that it has much more weight, it's something that I have to pay attention to. And... Right. I got to look at myself like who I think I am and to even represent myself. And maybe I have to force it sometimes. Maybe that's been the problem is that I'm afraid to force it because then it feels like it's manufactured. And that's not what I want either, right? How do you come out natural, confident? I guess confidence is part of it, right? When I talk about confidence being who you are. So how do you... I don't know. I'm, I've got a lot in my head right now. So I've got to take a moment to kind of figure... I'll try to figure some of this out, but disclaimer right now, it may just end like it hit a wall in a sense that, uh, sorry, this is kind of like my sociology head going when I'm thinking on um, like collateral damage. But it's collateral, never, it doesn't always have to be damaged. It could be collateral good as well. But 
what is the collateral damage being done by me effectively or essentially, sorry, having this image of who I am and when I look at myself, so not from my inself, but more from the outside um, and how much weight that has in my life in everything I do everywhere all the time, especially trying to go forward. Like, you know, I'm trying to live here in Austria and trying to get a job and trying to figure all that stuff out. Um, but even that, right. So I look at these pictures that I just got and I'm wearing a suit. I don't wear suits, right? It looks awkward. It looks like I do not deserve to be, not deserve, but that's not who I am. And I took a couple pictures, and one of them was without a shirt, without a suit on. And that picture without the suit, I felt more comfortable showing somebody that than I would showing them with the suit. And I looked like a clown in the suit. The other one, I looked, well, I looked not bad. That might be one of my ten that I would show somebody. The black and white one's even better than the color one. So for me, how do I want to be represented on that CV slash resume? Do I want to be perceived to somebody who grabs me as something that I'm not? And that will, but they're going off a picture, right? This is crazy. I talked about this last week about these CVs and these pictures. It still blows me away that 1000% they're hiring or they are making a split second decision when they see your picture. That's just, it is what it is. That sense, your sense of sight sees that before your sense of sight reads and comprehends what's on that resume. You've already made a decision in your brain of that person and then everything from that scope, everything will come from that lens um, just because it is. And that's, you know, right, I'm not an expert or anything like that, but think about it. It's called a no-brainer. Anyway, so to me, I'm like, okay, how do I want to look? And it's so strange because there's probably a game you have to play in order for to get a job in these resumes, right? So do you play along or do I have to become a suit? I don't know. I guess I need to figure out what I want to do first. Maybe what I want to do, you need to have a suit or you need to be a suit person And then I will just have to become a suit person because that's what I want to do. So then I have no problem wearing a suit and then everything's all solved. But it just doesn't feel right, right? So that's when I think about who I am. And right now I'm not a suit, right? In one of my sociology classes, and I would love to be able to recall her name, but I'm not very good with names. But she, I was in a presentation and my teacher, she's great, um had a comment about about um, sociologists and when they go to conferences and things like that and that you can tell who they are because they're just wearing jeans and a t-shirt. And right, that's kind of who what I am. And so is that the start of where I go try to discover what I want to do is deciding on and looking at other people around the world that I would want to emulate and look like or be like from even a physical point of view in the sense that what they look like, what they're wearing, things like that, and then do I work backwards from there? Maybe. This is what's so confusing is that with my OCD, I am all over the place with all of these things and these thoughts, and it feels like I don't want to just reach out and like just grab one. But I don't know, maybe I need to, if they're all weighted the same. So this is what the process is right now that I'm going through in my head, especially trying to live here with, and then everything else that's going on. And maybe this is a little bit more, I talk more like this once in a while um, and see where it goes from there. And maybe people can kind of, I don't know, whatever they want because I'm not going to tell anybody what to do. So, anyway, that's it. Like I said, right into a wall. Thank you. Okay, I'm back from that. Listening to that really draws a lot of emotion. Um, 
I've run out of time really today to talk about that, but this is something I'm going to talk about maybe next week is dig a little bit deeper in that, in, in that, you know, things like how you see yourself is how you project who you are and how other people see you and all, and just, just so much to it. I'm kind of in a emotional lull whenever I hear that. One thing is that I'll talk about quickly is that I got rid of the shark penises on my screensaver and I put a picture of myself on there that I think that I look good and how I would want to be represented as myself. And I'm trying to figure out if that is worth it or not or how that is affecting my day to day. And uh, I'm going to talk about that next week. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice day.